Well, Grace Chapel, we begin a series this morning that I've been anticipating for some time and and trying to bring together thoughts on for for quite a while. It's one that we've also been trying to prepare you for as we've sent out several emails, emails uh, addressing parents specifically about this topic because, again, as was mentioned as we were dismissing the children this morning, we will be talking about some things that could be considered sensitive depending upon the age of the ears we're speaking to. And so as we begin this series, by design, let me say that certainly I don't do this without some amount of trepidation concerning the subject matters that we will be engaging with and concerning the way that sometimes these words may be received. And it will be, they will be sometimes received by one group in some way and by another group potentially another way and certainly by the world outside of this building in a very different way as well. And so real quickly, again, the series is called By Design, Creation, Fall, and a call to live faithfully in spite of our brokenness. Now, as we begin this series, I'd actually like to reconnect with a series that we launched the year with, a series called Clay, asking the question, what is shaping you? And again, I want to acknowledge this, that that we live in a time where there are many different worldviews, and the way we address the idea of a worldview is we said that a worldview is the filter through which one makes sense of life and the framework through which one views reality. Now, you may have been with us on that journey, and if you are, you're probably familiar with this thinking about the idea of a worldview. Basically, it's your framework or paradigm upon which you build your life. Okay, so my framework, my paradigm, and then I build my life upon that. We might call that a foundation. And again, there are many different worldviews being proffered by the culture around us. But we as Christians should hold a a worldview that is both biblical and Christ-centered. That is the call upon us as followers of Jesus to to ask the question, what does Jesus think about this? What does God think about this, and what message did God leave us concerning this in Scripture as we believe that Scripture is the infallible Word of God, which we'll acknowledge here? We said this as well in this series, in the first series, the beginning of this year, that a Christ-centered or biblical worldview is first and foremost rooted in the belief that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. If we can't start there, then we don't have the foundation we need to establish a biblically rooted and grounded worldview. So the Bible is first and foremost the infallible word of God. And then the second piece of that, that it therefore is the foundation for the manner in which Christians view reality, or at least should be the foundation for which Christians view reality. It is our foundation. And then we build from there. I put out a post on social media this week, and some of you may have seen that. I know some of you commented on it as well. And I want to share this again with you here right now because I believe this speaks directly to this idea. And it also helps bridge us to what we will be talking about for the next few minutes. Here's what I said. We should never forget that God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. In fact, God says very plainly about his ways and our ways. He says, as high as as the heavens are above the earth, so my ways, my thoughts are above your thoughts. In other words, saying, you, the people that I created, we ought to look to him when trying to determine how we should think about something. Okay, let me take that one step further. We ought to look to him when determining how we should think about everything. That's the kind of people we ought to be. And so here's the acknowledgement I made in this post. While we may not always understand the words of God as we read them in the Bible, I'll tell you, there are things in Scripture that are hard for me to understand. Sometimes at an intellectual level, I just don't get it. And oftentimes at an emotional level as well. They create some tension within me. Okay, so while we may not always understand the words of God as we read them in the Bible and may even find ourselves tempted to disagree and argue with God on certain points, anyone ever been there? Have you ever read something in Scripture and wished, I, I, well, you know, I would like it if God would have said that differently? Or if God wouldn't have said that at all? Or God, isn't there an easier way to do this? I mean, there have been times probably where we have all been tempted to disagree and argue with God. 
Wrestling with God is a natural part of the Christian life. It means we're engaging God. And hopefully when that happens, God wins, right? So we may even find ourselves tempted to disagree and argue with God on certain points, but we can always trust. This is what I want you to hear, Christ followers. We can always trust that he, God, knows and wants what is truly best for us. And that is why we have to engage this series called By Design. I want to make a few acknowledgments as we jump into this series, particularly, again, related to this series. The first is this. We are not seeking to battle culture. As I share what I believe comes directly from the Word of God, I want you to hear this from me. I'm not seeking to battle culture. What I'm wanting to do is battle for people who are caught up in what I believe is an unhealthy flow of culture. Instead of battling against, I want to battle for, and I hope that's where you find yourself as well. We talked about in a previous series this this year also that, that God loves the people of this world, and you and I should too. God loves broken people. Thank God he loves broken people because I'm broken. And if God didn't love broken people, I'd be out. And so would you. And so when we love broken people well, we're doing the thing that God does best. So we need to love broken people well. So we're not seeking to battle culture, but we want to battle for the people who are caught up in an unhealthy flow of culture. And then I want to say this as well, because a lot of people will say, why are you even talking about this within the church? I mean, I've heard that cry. I've listened to podcasts where people have objected to these being topics that we discuss in the church. And here's what I want to say. We must engage the conversation, church, because we believe, I believe, that the only healthy and whole view of sex, sexuality, and gender is found in the picture that God paints within Scripture, and that the Word of God paints clearly for us. Now, here's something I learned over the last several years, and I've come to agree with this point. We need to be very careful when things are happening that we ought not agree with to be silent. A few years ago, as there was some really heightened tension surrounding the issue of race in this country, one thing I learned is that to be silent is to be complicit. If I see something happening that is not okay and God would not support it, if I'm quiet, I'm complicit. I need to speak out against injustice and oppression. You do too. In this case, Christians, I want to say this. Silence is also here in this case, complicity. If we in the church say nothing While the world is being blown every which way by the winds of culture, if we say nothing, here silence is also complicity. And there's a lot at stake. There's some new research, some new different studies that are showing that some of the reason for the prevalence of mental health issues within the younger generation today is that there is simply so much confusion. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to find real answers. Because the answer is, be ambiguous about everything. Be ambiguous about everything. But what we know is that children need more than anything a safe and stable and firm foundation. So if the answer is everything goes, we're actually not doing our children right. We're not doing right by them at all. I want to share with you just a couple of things real quick that that have jumped out to me in in preparing for this series and why we're talking about this. And this first one will really point out the kind of confusion that we're seeing in culture right now. Depending on who you look to, a quick Google search will claim that, that many say there are currently between 60 and 105 genders. Okay, 60 and 105 genders. Now, again, I'm not poking fun at any of this. It's a reflection of the brokenness we see in this world that there is so much confusion about even the topic of gender that we think there could be somewhere between 60 and 105 genders. 
In our age, there is an incredible confusion related to the topic of sex, sexuality, and gender. The second thing that I want to point out this, is this. As a friend of mine, Renee Sproul, says, we live in a time where sex is both everything and nothing. It, it's at the core of your identity, yet it's absolutely nothing to have sex with multiple partners whenever you want to, at any point in time, as long as there's consent. It's nothing. It's no big deal whatsoever. At the same time, it is everything because it's core to who you are. That has created incredible confusion for many who are living within the current flow of culture and so Christians. We have got to speak on this topic as the word of God speaks. Because again, I believe fully that the only healthy and whole communication about these topics comes directly from the mouth of God. And so I think we need to ask this question as we begin this series together. What is the biblical ideal? What is the biblical ideal? And what I mean by that is this. If we were to look only at Scripture, what would we be most likely to conclude about sex, sexuality, and gender? And I would acknowledge that different people conclude different things. Okay. But what would, we, what would we be most likely to conclude? And so I want to look at just four things. And here's what I'm going to acknowledge as we look at these four things that we would likely conclude about sex, sexuality, and gender. I want to acknowledge this. To some of you, this is going to seem so basic, you're going to say, okay, you didn't really tell me much. And likely, if that's you, you're probably going to be part of an older generation that 50 years ago, these things weren't even really talked about and discussed as far as what's happening in our world around us. But I want to also acknowledge there is a younger generation who may find what I'm going to say today extremely controversial. So that's part of the divide we're dealing with as we engage this message is that one group will say, basic, of course, yes. And another group will say, really? Shouldn't you be a little more subjective about those things? Allow some, allow some room for some more subjectivity? So I want to acknowledge that. But again, my heart is this right now. To look at Scripture and to ask this question, what does God, our Creator, have to tell us concerning the topics of sex, sexuality, and gender? What does God have to say? As we begin this conversation, I want to say this. It's my deepest desire to be like Jesus as we engage this conversation. As John describes him in John 1.14, saying that Jesus came from the Father full of both grace and truth. I don't want to lean one side or the other. I don't even want to be trying to figure out how to engage a balance between grace and truth. I want to be like Jesus, if possible, and be full of grace and truth. And so I hope as I share this that you'll receive this with grace and truth in mind and understand that that is where my heart is this morning. Okay, so let's just look at these four things that we would be likely to discover, again, if we only looked at Scripture. The first is this. God created humans, male and female, reflecting his image and unique characteristics. Genesis 1, 27 through 28 make this fairly plain. God created both male and female, both men and women, in his image. So I think we need to say this and state this very plainly. Both men and women uniquely reflect the image of God. Now, very often, we've almost thought as though only men reflected the image of God, and that's because oftentimes in Scripture we see the male pronoun linked with God. He, him, his, right? Over and over again, we see those things. And so I'm not going to address that piece of it, but I do want us to see very plainly that both men and women uniquely reflect the image of God. And I want you to see there is feminine imagery in the Bible related to, related to the nature of God. And if that makes you uncomfortable, I think you need to take a deep breath 
and be okay with this because both men and women uniquely reflect the image of God. Let me just give you a little bit of feminine imagery in the Bible related to the nature of God. We don't have to talk about the male imagery because we all are familiar with that. We know that. But I want you to see very plainly that God has this feminine side in a sense. Again, I know that may be uncomfortable for some. But men and women both uniquely reflect the image of God. Listen to the words of Deuteronomy 32.18. There, Deuteronomy 32.18 describes God as giving birth to the Israelites, saying, you forgot the God who gave you birth. Isaiah 49.15 speaks of God having the compassion of a mother for her nursing child. Listen to these words. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, God declares, I will not forget you. Hosea 11, 3 through 4, compares God to a nurturing mother. Listen to this. I can think about imagery. You know, this, this really connects with me. I can think about the times when my wife was helping our kids walk, and I was just kind of sitting there saying, go do it, buddy. You got this, right? Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms. But they did not know I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness. Look at that imagery. With bands of love. I was to them, those who lift infants, to their cheeks. See those words. God says, I bent down and fed them. In Matthew 23, 37, Jesus himself expresses a very mother-like sentiment as he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how I have often longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. What I want to say about this is that these scriptures clearly use feminine imagery to communicate God's love, compassion, and nurturing nature towards humanity. Now, does that mean that men can't be filled with love, compassion, and that men aren't nurturing? No, but what it means is God would have used different imagery to describe that. Would not have said like a mother nursing at her breast. These scriptures clearly use feminine, feminine imagery, and therefore we've got to conclude that both men and women uniquely reflect and are created in the image of God. Okay, second. Sex is a biological and anatomical distinction that distinguishes male and female, Genesis 1, 27 through 28. Now, again, some of you may be saying basic, and others may be saying, whoa, hold on. I want you to read this verse with me. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them with a very intentional distinguishing male and female he created them. What did God intend? Male and female, he created them. Now, what we find in the vast predominance of the population is that we can very easily distinguish biologically men from women, not just by looking at someone's body, but if we were to go down to the detail of every cell, we would find that every cell bears these markers, XY for men and XX for women. Every cell would declare that someone is either a man or a woman. That's just at a very basic level. Now, the truth about this is there are some times when genetics get a little bit crossed. And there is a syndrome in which men can be born with two X chromosomes and a Y after that, but the Y chromosome still very plainly distinguishes that man as a man. There may be some confusion there, I understand. Now, what this does not account for, again, this accounts for biology. What this does not account for is psychology. And I want to acknowledge that there are times where people may feel a certain way on the inside. But the biology would say different. Okay, so just at a very basic level, God created them male and female. That was God's intent. The third thing that I would see is this. Biblical sexuality is designed to be expressed 
solely, and that word is very important there, solely, alone, only, within the context of marriage between one man and one woman. We'd see this very plainly in Genesis 1, 28, 2, 24, Matthew 19, 4 through 6, and we're going to look at a couple of these passages in the next few minutes. I want you to see what Genesis 2, 22 through 24 says this. Then the Lord God made woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Now, this is that moment where Adam has been naming the animals, and somehow in the animals, he doesn't find that dog is man's best friend. He finds that he's lacking and needs something more, and God says it's not good for this man to be alone. There is something else needed, a a different type of relationship that we as humanity need. The animals weren't enough. Okay, so this is what happens. God made man from the rib. He had taken out a woman from man. He'd taken out of the rib, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now, the author of Genesis now editorializes and says this. Because of all this, says the author of Genesis, that is why a man, one man, this is very plainly singular in the Hebrew text, leaves his father and mother and united to his wife, one wife, again singular, and they become one flesh, also singular. All of this singular. A man leaves his father and mother to be united to his wife and they become one flesh. Okay, so hold that idea in your mind and we're going to look at Matthew 19, 4 through 6, because Jesus uses this passage to speak his own theological truth at this point. Matthew 19, 4 through 6, Jesus saying, Jesus speaking, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, again, referencing Genesis 1, that at the beginning, the creator, God, made them male and female and said, for this reason... Now we're into Genesis 2. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So far, what Jesus is doing is quoting Scripture. Quoting Scripture verbatim from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Now, Jesus says, here are implications. Just like the author of Genesis said, here are some implications out of that. Jesus says, here are my implications. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. So two people have become one in this. And then here is Jesus editorializing. He says, therefore, what God has joined together, Jesus' words, let no one separate. What God has joined together, let no one separate. And so out of this, I think we can also conclude this, going from point three to point four and tying them together. There's a bridge between these two that marriage is intended to be. That was the intent of marriage. A lifelong commitment between one man and one woman. What God has joined together, as Jesus says in Matthew 19, 6, let no one separate. That's the intent. Now, there are a lot of things we could point to where we could actually look in secular science and psychology and get an understanding of why this is best and better. It, it is. I mean, we're going to look at just one thing real quick, and this is kind of a a summary of a a study that was done on it. You can look this up if you want yourself, GillespieShields.com. The benefits of children growing up in a stable nuclear family with two parents. What are the benefits? Children growing up in homes where two parents who have been married continuously are less likely to experience a wide range of problems, academic, social, emotional, cognitive, not only in childhood, but later on in adulthood as well. We have known for some time, and many in psychology are re-acknowledging this at this point, even though there's a push against it at times, that the family unit is the basic building block upon which all healthy societies are built. It's the case. It's the truth. Now, some may be saying this, and I'll acknowledge this, but, but we see plenty of cases in the Bible in which some practice polygamy, and, and of course there are cases of divorce and everything else in Scripture. Yes, there were times where God allowed things, but there's a difference between allowed and intended. What God intended and what God allowed are often not the same thing because we are a broken people. Sometimes God has allowed things that he did not intend. And let me say it this way. Not every passage in the Bible is prescriptive. 
You can read something in Scripture and say, oh, look, we can see this in the Bible, so we might even call it biblical. Except we would be wrong in calling it biblical because we would have missed it. That Scripture was only describing something, not prescribing and saying this is what it ought to be. And so what we need to say about Scripture is this. Much of what we read in the Bible details the stories of broken lives of those who were learning to follow God in the midst of their brokenness. Church, that's the story of my life and yours as well. And so what I want to say is this. If you look at yourself this morning and recognize I'm a broken person, and in truth that should be all of us, I'm a broken person. Broken people can learn to follow God in the midst of their brokenness. We'll talk about that more in week three, that our call, the call on all of us, every one of our lives is to, in the midst of our brokenness, in spite of our brokenness, learn to live in faithfulness to God. The world needs to see a church living in faithfulness, not compromising not stopping loving, but living in faithfulness, in what all faithfulness looks like. That's why we're engaging this series by design, because it's incredibly important that we're not silent, church. That we try to be a people who embrace a biblical worldview, even when there's so much pushback Sometimes from without, and yes, also from within. And again, I want to reiterate one thing that I said at the beginning of this message. And here's where I want all of us to be. Right here. We may not understand the words of God as we read them in the Bible. Can we acknowledge that? There are times where we don't understand. We don't understand what, and we don't understand why. And because of that, we may even be tempted to find ourselves disagreeing and arguing with God, especially about these topics. But church, can we acknowledge that we can always, because of who God is, because of what we believe about who God is, we can always trust that he knows and wants what's best for us. And so it is my hope as we engage these conversations further in this series, next week we'll have a a panel discussion, and the following week we'll talk about, okay, how do we live? How do we live? What kind of people do we need to be? How do we engage with the world around us in week three? As we believe these things to be true, that God created us, male and female, that he said one man and one woman, that's what marriage looks like, that I want that one man and woman, if they can, to to make a family, to be fruitful and multiply. I want them to be the building block upon which society is built, a healthy society. As we engage these topics together, let's do it with this heart. We may not understand, or we may even sometimes disagree, but let's acknowledge that God knows and wants what's best for us. Let's pray. God, as we engage this series, as we walk through these conversations together, God, will you help us to see that you love us so much, that you call us to what's good and best. And coming to what is good and best is not going to be without difficulty for all of us, God. We know that's true. We're broken people, but thank you for loving us in spite of our brokenness. God, thank you for being the God who never gives up on us, who loves all of the people of this world with an unfailing, never-ending love and who calls us to do the same. Father, may we see the brokenness in this world as something that actually draws us in love to the people around us as opposed to pushing us away from people. And as we continue this conversation, may it be, Father, that we are like Jesus, who came from you, Father, full of grace, compassion, love, but also full of truth, not afraid to have the difficult conversations. God, may we be those people. This is my prayer, and the church said, amen.